continuing our second exercise. We just came back from the weekend. We have to remind ourselves what we're doing. We might even have to remind ourselves how to access it from the Canvas course. So the exhaustive instructions and background on every project you'll find under unit modules. And that syncs up with what we are expected to do in the course outline. And we were working on the unit three vector shape module. But if you've already been introduced to it, as we have in the last class, we don't need to go through all of that. We could just go to the home page and click on assignments, which is right underneath unit module. This is like your shortcut to where you post the assignment. So if we want to go right to where the instructions are and posting, we go click right here. Now, on future assignments, I'm going to go back one. That assignments page is our shortcut to where we can post the assignments, but it's also where you're going to see these kind of extras for the assignment that you won't find anywhere else. So in this case, some examples of professional artists that use compositing in their work, because we're going to be doing for assignment one a composite fantasy landscape. This artist is a fine artist that uses their own photography to make their fantasy landscapes. And then this artist is a commercial artist that builds things for clients for marketing purposes based on composites that are not their own imagery, imagery that they, they source and find online like we're going to be doing. You know, like for Volkswagen here, that kind of thing. So once we get into the assignment, starting later today with assignment one, you're going to see these extras. And sometimes they're, they're by past students giving professional examples. Sometimes they're resources by me. And then after we get through the midterm, I'm going to have a lot of these because there's a lot of good external things to keep in mind when we're doing things like digital coloring, digital inking, color separation, digital painting. So that's all found on the assignments page. But for now, we just want to go to exercise two that we had started. And you can follow the step-by-steps here. We created our own kind of flat emoji. So what do we do first? We go to our documents folder and you find your folder, drag it to the desktop, open it up. And if you're very organized like mine is, you'll have an exercise two folder already. But somewhere in your folder, you should have a screenshot or a PNG either works of that custom emoji you made using the, the site that's linked here. Right. We also talked about the difference between the SVG file that you can also download from that site because that site makes vectors. And vectors are layered shapes that have no resolution. So no matter how big you make them, zooming in, printing out, they can be infinitely clean. That's what we call scalable at any resolution. So you won't see any pixels ever on a vector. But vectors have to get expressed onto your screen. So when you do a screen grab, like I did here, that was a vector shape out of the program, but my screen is only 72 pixels per inch. So if I look at the size of that image, I was able to get something that was close to 8 by 8 inches at 72 pixels per inch, which is not a great resolution. It's good for kind of small icon size screen stuff, but it's not good enough for 8 by 10 at print resolution at 300 pixels per inch. So what we're going to do is we're going to have to create our own vector shapes to make our emoji. So we start with that screenshot and we opened it up in Photopea. It's also linked in the assignment, but I can just type in photopea.com. I don't even have to log in on any browser. And we're not going to need a tablet for this. Vectors are made to be like mouse easily clicked and organized. And I brought that screenshot in, right? But this screenshot is still just a screenshot at low resolution. So I had to go to image size and I had to change it to inches and I wanted to make it at least eight by 10. And because it's close to a square, I'm going to take the smallest dimension and make that 10. 
So now it's 10 by 10.13, right? And then I'm going to change that pixels per inch, which should be PPI, to 300, or if you're feeling generous with it, 350. As long as it's at least 8 by 10 inches and at least 300 pixels per inch, you are meeting the requirements. I do 350. It's what I call my lab resolution under image size because that gives you a little bit more flexibility when printing to make it bigger. I say OK, and look what it does to my pixels. It makes them all jagged and soft at the edges. That's why we have to replace this with vectors because this is the printable resolution. Then I start using the vector tools. So how do I make these clean? I go three up from the bottom. This is what's called the tools. This is your toolbar off to the side. It should stay there. So the tool we're mostly going to use for this project are called the shape tools. And they are vector shapes. So when I click on the ellipse, for instance, and I drag and drop to kind of make my circle, if I want it to be a perfect circle, I can hold down shift while I do it. This will be my first basic shape. It creates a new layer for me, but that layer in the icon of the layer, I'll zoom in on it so you can see. In the icon of the layer, just like the smart objects from before, this has a little box in the preview. That means it's not a rasterized layer. It's not a pixel-based layer. In this case, it is referencing and building pixels based on a vector. And it's getting that vector from the shape tool you choose, chose. So your requirement for this project is to only make your emoji out of these shape tools. We have a rectangle. We have an ellipse, which can also be a circle. The rectangle can also be a square. We have a parametric shape tool, which can be a triangle, a pentagon, an octagon, a hexagon, right? The way that works is you click on it, and then you say how many sides you want. So if you want a triangle, you say three sides, and then you get a triangle shape. Right? And then the custom shape tool. And the custom shape tool, you'll see this library of shapes up in the corner. You can see that typefaces are shapes, right? They're vector shapes. You'll have animals. You'll have arrows, which is incredibly useful for emojis. You'll have brands, which is kind of interesting that they got licensed to do this for FedEx and for Ember and for eBay. But this is for marketing purposes, right? So these are clean vector logos for things like DHL and Facebook, right? But you are not able to erase from these objects, right? So like if I wanted just the HL, I'm out of luck. So how would I get rid of the D? Well, I might overlap it with another shape. Think of them as cutouts of construction paper, right? But what you can do, and this gives us practice on what we are learning with exercise one, is you can take those layers. Each shape will be its own layer. You can use the move tool. And you can do Option Command T, which is Edit Free Transform, Option Command T, right? Which will give you the transform box around them, as long as you have that layer selected. And that transform box allows you to scale it, rotate it, if you hold down Shift to squish it. And if you right click inside it to warp it, perspective it, distort it, skew it, Flip it horizontally, flip it vertically, rotate it. But I like warp the best, which I can take this triangle and I can make it curvy. Ooh. By pushing and pulling on it, just like we were with our line art for exercise one. And I can get something that looks like a little ghost blob. The other thing we need to know with these vector shapes is that they are going to be filled with just one pixel color. And we choose that color by double clicking on the preview window on the shape layer. So when you double click there, it will get you to this color selector. And you can pick the color right from here using the, the hue spectrum on the side and then using the saturation picker. 
or you can just use so the DHL la label I can just use the color picker whenever the color picker is up I can just click on something that's open within photo P and it will automatically match that color so you can see the DHL logo changing with the colors I'm picking all right when you don't need a shape you can delete it or you can turn it off so for this black shape I'm going to double click and I'm going to turn it to yellow to match then I can use my move tool and I can move it in notice it looks like there's an outline around your shape around your vector But when you click off of it, that will disappear. That's because vectors have an outline and a fill. But the default within PhotoP is for the shape tools to have the, the outline turned off. What's nice about that, why we're going to leave it that way, is if I want to add an outline later, I'm going to use layer styles for that, which work perfectly with vectors. So I'll double click, and then I'll click stroke in the layer style. And then I can play with the color of the stroke and its position whether it's on the inside, whether it's on the center, or whether it's on the outside. And that gives me actually more control than the vector path stroke would give me. And then effects will just turn off when we don't need them. Okay, so that's how we brought it in. That's kind of a review. I had started that all already and saved it as a PSD. So I'm just going to open up my PSD. And I had just built one shape. Now, I want to remember the book that I said I was going to do from the, the BAM book list, Fahrenheit 451. And I was thinking something about like matches, flames. These are some of my inspiration images, like a burning book. So maybe a head with like a burning book on top of it and flames. That could be fun. I wasn't able to make that idea clear in my sketch, right? I just used things that were kind of close to it. So I do like the expression I was able to get, but you can veer away from your, your raster sketch pretty quickly. So with my shape, how do I change this shape? Option Command T or Edit Free Transform. And I can start kind of tweaking it. I can hold down shift. I can set it in here. Uh, I guess I will make it a little bit wider. Or I can shift it up. And then how do I change the color? I double click on it. And then I can either pick the color from the color picker. I actually kind of like this paler, grayer yellow. So to get to the color for your shape layers, you just double click on the preview window in the layer. That will bring up this color picker. And you can choose it from here using this and this, or you can actually just click on something that's open within Photoshop. That's called the eyedropper tool. So once you get out of the color picker, it turns automatically to the eyedropper tool. But I wanted something more kind of moody and dark yellow, kind of like this. So already I'm deviating from my sketch a little bit. Okay, pretty soon we're going to start with your big shapes first, just like if you're cutting this out of construction paper and layering them up like a paper doll. But this shape now covers up all the other shapes I need to make. So what I'm going to do is a technique called onion skinning. This is going to come in handy for a lot of our projects. And I'm going to duplicate the background. So I select my background. Remember, at the, we're at the right resolution now. So you can always check your image size. So I'm at at least 8 by 10 by at least 300 in my resolution. And now I'm going to Command J, duplicate that background. Photo P is just a little slow on me here. So it made two. Then I'm going to move that background up on top of everything. And you can do that by clicking and dragging, or you can do it, this is going to come in handy as we build up lots of shape layers, by using Command right bracket to move up and Command left 